Marcus and I play the shakuhachi. In this introductory series on the shakuhachi we already covered a few topics. The history of the shakuhachi, how to get your first tone, what a suitable first instrument is and so on. And today I'm going to talk about shakuhachi notation. But before I start, in the spirit of Christmas, which is very close, even if maybe you see this video half a year later in hot summer, <laughs> it is very close to Christmas. So please do me a favor and subscribe to my channel or like the video if you like it. Uh, that would mean very much to me. Thank you very much. The first thing that I should say about shakuhachi notation is that shakuhachi notation is a very big mess. Not quite as messy as my studio at the moment, which I'm still remodeling, but it is very messy. At first I thought, oh yeah, I'll just do a video on shakuhachi notation. But then when I started getting into it, making my notes for the video, I realized that it is actually quite a big topic and it can be very confusing. So I'll split this into multiple videos and in this one I'll just talk about the basic symbols and about the very fundamentals of notation. And then in future videos I'll talk about other topics like uh, the rhythm, for example, or more ways to write Mary and Cuddy and things like that. As in all my previous videos I should mention as well that I'm talking about Kinko notation and in particular about the notation that is used by the KSK, by the Kokusai Shakuhachi Kenshukan. This is the school established by Yokoyama Katsuya. And before we get into the actual details of notation, I need to point out that Shakuhachi notation, as all Japanese, traditional Japanese notation, has a very different purpose than what we may understand a score to be or a notation to be in the West. In Japan, the notion of a score is that it is just a memory aid. So it has no intrinsic value. And apart from the simplest songs, you cannot really play a shakuhachi piece just looking at the notation and just playing from the notation. In contrast, in the West, especially in classical Western music, the score has a very high value. And there is this notion that really when you perform a piece of classical music or a piece of music that you interpret the score. So the score is the origin and then the music follows from the score. And you can see that this view is diametrically opposed to the Japanese view. Scores may be written in beautiful calligraphy, but apart from that, they have no value. They have no musical value as such. And this view on notation is also one of the main reasons why there are very many variations between scores, even from the same school, even from the same writer, because as I say, it is really only a memory aid. There is no standardized notation as such that you're expected to interpret when you perform a piece of music. So the Japanese way to learn a piece is to listen to recordings, to get to know the piece, to get some instructions, some explanation on the piece. And typically you would get this from obviously a person who knows the piece. And typically you would get this from a shakuhachi teacher because in particular for shakuhachi, I'm not so sure about other traditional Japanese instruments, but in particular for shakuhachi, there are very many nuances that you have to produce to adequately produce and perform a shakuhachi piece. And these really can only be learned by direct instruction from a teacher. So starting at the beginning, um, this is a typical score that you can find. This piece is Rokudan no Shirabe. And the thing, the first thing that you need to know is that obviously this is a Japanese score. So we use the traditional Japanese writing. And this means we start at the top right and we go down. And then we take the next column and then we go down. And then we go to the next column and go down. And we go from right to left, not from left to right. Okay, so this takes a bit of getting used to. And as I say, you go from top to bottom. Um, the very first thing that you will have here is the name of the piece. So this says Rokuda no Shirabe. And some explanation may follow. And here, this is where, in this particular notation, this particular score, the piece actually starts. The symbols that are used in a shakuhachi notation are taken from the Japanese katakana alphabet. And each of the symbols represents a fingering on the instrument. So it does not encode the pitch as we have in Western notation, where a C, for example, or a C1, let's say, encodes a certain frequency. But in the Japanese notation, this encodes a fingering. 
So, for example, if I have the symbol re, this means on the shakuhachi I have this fingering where I have holes one and two open and I'm closing holes three, four and five. Okay, this is what the symbol re represents. This means that we can have the same note in the Western sense. So a musical event with the same frequency, if you like, um, by having different fingerings. So for example, if I take the note E, this, that is this note, holes one and two are closed, three, four and five are open. This is the same note. This is the same frequency as I have in Kannoro. So this note and this note, they have the same pitch, but they are different notes in the Japanese system. Uh, one is where all holes are closed, one where you have the top three holes open. And for the shakuhachi, this is particularly relevant because it is very important when you play a piece on the shakuhachi to think about the tone color that you produce. So if you play in E, you have a more open sound. And when you play a row, you have more overtones. Okay, there are already videos on how to produce the basic notes in Otsu, in the lower register, and in Kan, in the higher register. So please refer to these videos, and I'm going to link them up here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, please look at those videos if you want to know more about the basic notes in the two um, main registers. There are three registers on the shakuhachi. Two are the main registers. The first one is otsu, the lower register. And then we have kan, which is the higher register. And above kan, there is daikan. In most traditional pieces, you really only use otsu and kan, and maybe one or two notes from daikan, so from the third octave. But modern flutes actually can produce most of the notes in daikan as well. So in modern pieces, meaning pieces that have been composed in the 20th century or later, um, you have notes in daikan as well. The symbol for otsu, or it is traditionally also called ryo, but in KSK we call it otsu. Uh, the symbols are here for otsu and for ryo. Um, I just need to edit it <laughs> correctly. Um, and for kan we use uh, this symbol here. And then we have daikan, which basically just means big kan. The basic rule is that at the start of a notation, the register is indicated and you stay in the same register until another register is indicated. So if you start a piece in otsu, for example, you just continue playing in otsu until kan is being notated. And then you stay in kan until otsu again is indicated. However, there is one big exception, and that is the change from ri to ro, or from ri to tsu. So if you play otsu no ri, so ri and otsu, that is this note where three and four are open, all other holes are closed. And the next notated note is ro. Then this note, this ro is played in kan. So not Okay, that's exception number one. And exception number two is if tsu follows after ri, you also play it in the high octave in kan. So, and not, okay. So in that case, for example, if you play ri and want otsu no tsu, uh, so tsu in the lower octave, this would have to be explicitly notated. Okay, but if it's not notated, ri, tsu always means ri in otsu, and then tsu in kan. Okay, the other way up, so if we go up, we want to go down as well, <laughs> is easier because ri is actually a note that only occurs in otsu, so in the lower octave. That means that if you play tsu in kan, and then the next note is ri, this always has to be otsu, because ri only exists in otsu. The corresponding note, so the note where you close one and two and five and have three and four open in kan is called hi, so we use a different symbol. So this is ri, otsu note, 
and he and can. This means that whatever note, wherever we are, if we're in kan, if we're in daikan, if we're in otsu, it doesn't matter. When you see ri, it's always this note in otsu. If you see he and you're somewhere in otsu or you're in daikan, he is always played in kan. So this makes the downward movement easier. So the general rule that you just stick with the same octave until something else is indicated um, holds except for the change from ri to ro or from ri to tsu. Okay. And there are actually a few other notes which are specific to an octave. So for example, u, which is this note here. It's a half step below chi. Also is only notated for otsu. And here, just to link back to what I said earlier, uh, we can see that the fingering is encoded and not the pitch because this note, when we play this in kan, we use a different fingering. Okay, so here we use this fingering for kan, we use this fingering for otsu. It is even a bit more complicated than that because you can use this fingering in otsu as well. However, mostly you use this fingering for this note, this U fingering for the note. There are a few more of these cases where you can immediately see whether a note is in kan or in otsu just by looking at the symbol itself and you don't need to worry about the octave being indicated um, on the right by the corresponding symbol. The next symbol I'm going to briefly talk about is this one here. <laughs> Again, I need to edit this properly afterwards. Um, this is called an atari. This is a finger hit. Ataris are really just, so let me, so if I play re for example, and I want to repeat re. This is, what, this is what we do traditionally for Japanese music, that we lift the finger. For Western wind instruments, the technique that is used is tonguing. So we do t -t 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 -t. So to repeat a note, we would do this. This is not done in traditional Japanese music. Instead, you just keep blowing. So the airstream just keeps constant. And then you lift the finger. Okay, this lifting of the finger is indicated by the atari or this repeat mark. Just to add a bit more to the confusion, there is also a way to repeat a note by hitting the next lower note down. And that is usually regarded as equivalent, more or less. Uh, depending on the musical context, etc., etc. Um, but there we really get into the nuances of shakuhachi technique, which we're not doing in this introductory video. Um, okay, but the basic symbol is the repeat mark, the atari, for the atari, for the finger hit. The next basic aspect of shakuhachi notation is how to notate meri and kari. I've not yet made a video about meri and kari because actually it's quite a complex topic, um, but there will be, of course, a video on meri and kari as well. The basic symbols for meri and kari are these. Again, edit it in later. <laughs> and they are just the katakana symbols me for short for meri and ka for kari, short for kari. Kari is quite straightforward. So playing kari just means go half a step up. So for example, if you play chi, and then it says chi kari, this just means um, change the angle, change your blowing angle and go half a step up. That's basically what kari means. The story for Mary is a bit more complicated because we can not only go half a step down, but we can actually go down one and a half steps. And with proper technique, we can do, go down even further than just one and a half steps from a note. But for notation purposes, um, we really need to worry about going down one and a half steps. There are three levels of Mary, um, half a step down, one step down and one and a half steps down. What makes Mary a bit 
complicated <laughs> is that sometimes MEDI, just indicating MEDI with the ME symbol, means that we go down half a step and sometimes it means to go down a whole step. For example, for RE, RE MEDI means go down half a step. However, if MEDI is indicated for RE, so for this note again, it means go down a whole step. The reason for that is that the distance pitch-wise between the basic notes is not always the same. Between Rho and Tsu there are one and a half steps. Between Tsu and Re there is one step. Between Re and Qi there is one step. Between Qi and Ri there are one and a half steps again. And between Ri and Rho there is one step again. For those cases where we have one whole step, Medi indicates a half step down. For those cases where there is one and a half steps between two notes, MEDI indicates go down one whole step. This means that for these two notes, for TSU and for RE, if you want to indicate to go down just half a step, we use CHU MEDI. And the symbol for that is the kanji CHU, again edited in here, I hope. <laughs> um, and this means go down half a step. So, RE, CHU NO MEDI, means go down half a step. Tsu chu no meri means go down half a step from tsu. The third thing that can be notated is called dai meri or o meri, translated big meri. And this means go down half a step more from meri. This means for Re to start with that, if we have indicated Meri, we go down half a step. If we have indicated Re O Meri, we go down a whole step. Okay, Meri indicates half a step, O Meri a further half step. For Ri and for Tsu, Meri already indicates a whole step down. And that means that Tsu Dai Meri means go down one and a half steps. This is exactly the same pitch as Ro. So, from Tsu, that is Meri, and Dai Meri, this is Tsu Dai Meri, this is the same pitch as Ro. Okay, and the same system holds for Ri. The reasoning behind this is that Daimeri, when we talk of Daimeri, it means that we have the same pitch as the next lower basic note. Okay, so if we have Re Daimeri, we go down to Tsu. If we have Tsu Daimeri, we go down to Ro pitch. If we have Ri Daimeri, we go down to Chi pitch. If we have Chi Daimeri, we go down to Re pitch. That takes a bit getting used to um, to make the distinction that this me symbol, this katakana me, can mean something different depending on the note. But you'll get used to this quickly, I'm sure. <laughs> the final symbol that I'll briefly talk about is called kamuri or nayashi. And this is a movement of going down and going up again. So basically kamuri and nayashi mean the same thing. And there, there is just one symbol, this wavy line. And the terms really don't have a distinction. Some people prefer to make somewhat of a distinction where kamuri is this movement. So I'll do, do it from Re. This means go down by playing Medi to the two pitch and then come up again. Okay. This would be called a kamuri, whereas a nayashi also starts at a lower pitch, but then goes up slowly. So, so usually you would call it nayashi when you play re and then start a new movement by going down to re daimeri pitch, equivalent to tsu, and then going up slowly. And Kamuri would just be a fluid movement. Okay, but notation-wise, this is the same. And again, we link back to something I said earlier. 
to really know what is written in the score, you have to either listen to somebody playing the piece correctly, or you have to talk to a teacher or to somebody who knows the piece and can explain it to you. Because just from the score, you cannot tell the difference. Right. Um, that's it for the first part of notation, of Shakuhachi notation. I hope it was not too confusing. I try to be as clear as I can. If there is anything unclear, leave me a comment down below. I'm always happy to give you more information. And if what I said today was too confusing, which I know it can be, <laughs> then there will just be another video trying to make it a bit clearer. Um, so yes, please leave me a comment. Um, again, as I said at the start of the video, please subscribe to my channel. Um, it really makes a big difference in particular because my channel is still very small, um, steadily growing, but still very small. So every subscriber really counts. Thank you for that. And please like the video. The YouTube algorithm really likes that. Um, and if you want to see more of these videos, that really helps um, not just motivating me, but also motivating the YouTube algorithm that you actually see the videos when I publish them. Okay, thanks for watching this video and I hope to see you in my next one. Bye.